please welcome Miss Jane Russell. <laughs>
Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> now, if you don't know television, um, he's some bloke that took over from Bruce Willis and Demi Moore. <laughs> I, was, I was a celebrity journalist. This is a genuine paparazzi picture of me with Misha Bond. <laughs> and notice, I'm the one trying not to be recognised. <laughs> I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing Ashton Kutcher. I ask him about religion. Why? <laughs> Ten hours later, I can't get out of it. <laughs> so I've got no problem with religion, Ashton. I guess I just don't like priests. It's all right, isn't it? Priests. Hmm. I've got some really great books. Two. <laughs> yeah, but I've only got four priests. No, three priests. Not four priests. Uh, one of them I didn't really know. Uh, no, I've got four priests. I've got five priests and two of them. I think it's going to be wrong. You know, I think it's going to be wrong. But I think that you need to think about your thinking a little bit. <laughs> Here's what I wrote about Ashton Kutcher. Ashton really is the coolest person in America. <laughs> but, so that anyone that hates their job, I've put it down to minimum effort. I've patented two magic questions for interviewing celebrities. Now with these two questions, you can find out what makes any celebrity in the world tick. You can find out what makes John Travolta tick. <laughs> Apart from Cog. <laughs> You're in amazing shape. What's your secret? Like, the celebrity will always reply, Am I? Oh, that's so nice of you, because I never do any exercise. I've got to tell you, I pretty much live off cheese. But, the question one's important, because it allows your celebrity to relax, open up, like a bomb hole on amyl nitrate. We all know what you're most famous for. I usually don't. How does it make you feel? You're not appreciated for your inner talents. You've got no idea what their inner talents are. You hate these people. But a celebrity will always tell you. <laughs> the Ashton piece comes out, there it is. Everyone's happy. So happy. London Evening Standard Call. They said, Jane, Ashton started dating the lovely Domain. Christ, there she is. Go back to Ashton, get some quotes about the lovely Domain. I say, sure. But when I look at the papers, all the quotes that I was going to steal, obviously fabricated. It takes one to know one. <laughs> Evening Standard Call back. They say, we've got to have a quote. A quote about the lovely Domain. What? I've got a quote about the lovely Domain. Well, what do you think he thinks about dating Domain? British journalism. What do I think he thinks? <laughs> I think he thinks it's great. Christ. I'm in Hollywood, Santa Monica Boulevard, relaxing with a frozen yoghurt. Sweetened with splendour. Of course, it's crippling farts, but no sugar. <laughs> my phone rings. Is that Jane Busman? My name is Marty Singer. <laughs> I'm a lawyer representing Ashton Kutcher. And I'm calling you about the quote in the London Evening Standard. I'm thinking, what did I write? Ashton really is the coolest person in America to me. What did they print? Let me read it to you, Jane. Ashton says, to me, was the hottest actress in Hollywood when I was growing up. Now it's great. I'm fucking her. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> My editor at the London Evening Standard, who should remain nameless, <laughs> Explain to me. A couple of small snippets from other sources were added in. This, I agree, is not ideal. Marty Singer's the biggest litigation lawyer in the United States of America. That is how not ideal this is. <laughs> Marty Singer's office calls back, but this time it's not Marty, it's his good cop. She's saying, we're sorry you're caught in the middle of this. All you've got to do, put it in writing, you never said that. We won't have to bother you again. Oh, phew. I choose not being sued, so I email Marty's office. Not my years of journalism. I've never had an editor behave like this. I'm furious. Translated as, I own nothing of value. <laughs> what did Marty do? He releases this ridiculous email 
as my official public statement. I was quoted on national television, insulting my employer. Next day, I considered it prudent to look for a new career. <laughs> now, job hunting, sense of watching television. I come across this man, doctors without borders, neurosurgeon. This man parachutes into a war zone, nothing to protect him except his walkie-talkie. But when I change channels, I see Tom Cruise and his publicist, also a walkie-talkie. What does a publicist need a walkie-talkie for? He's a tiny actor getting in a car. Uh, I had an epiphany. There's two kinds of people in this world. Useful people and useless people. This means I've spent my entire adult life being absolutely useless. Not like that Doctors Without Borders guy. I bet that Doctors Without Borders neurosurgeon could fuck any refugee he likes. <laughs> I decided to defect from Hollywood and become a useful person. I sent my CV, resume, straight to Doctors Without Borders. That's French. Doctors Without Borders, not currently recruiting celebrity journalists. I'm hurt, but I noticed they're also not currently recruiting aromatherapists. <laughs> Doctors Without Borders, what international incident has led to this ruling? <laughs> 20 resumes, 20 charities, nobody wants me, so I'm useless. Until my sister calls, Kate. Kate, she's features editor of In Style magazine, on purpose. <laughs> It says, Jane, I've got a job for you. Rachel Weiss, this is Rachel Weiss. Rachel Weiss has just made The Constant Gardener. It's a film about the drug companies exploiting the slums in Kenya. We want you to ask Rachel, who's her favorite designer? <laughs> Tell my sister, no. And later, yes, for money, but okay, I an idea. I am perfect for this job. I've already got a DKNY safari dress. <laughs> it's my role model, Kate Aiden. She covered Bosnia, Albania, Tiananmen Square. I could do all of that when I find out what this place is on. <laughs> all I need is a massive story. So I go straight to Google. <laughs> my Google. Most evil man in the world. And I get this guy. Now, he may look like Dave Chappelle's Rick James. <laughs> but he isn't, no, he's not. It's just Coney, you know this, Coney 2012, you know. Lord, say they're the student protest group or a front for the CIA. Yeah, like the CIA, if they want to get into Africa, they spend nine years infiltrating a student protest group and growing emo hair. <laughs> Fuck it, the CIA want to get into Africa, they land at Kigali International Airport and say, hello, we're the CIA, we'll be in our usual rooms. Christ! <laughs> Joseph Coney kidnaps kids. Joseph Coney has kidnapped between um, 20 and 68,000 children. And in 30 years, nobody's found him. It's an incredible story. So I called the BBC. It's true. I said, you've got to do this story. I said, no. Nah. I said, why not? We just had Africa Week. <laughs> I need a new angle. I need a new, less black angle. <laughs> I'm flipping through an obscure political journal. When I come across <laughs> this man, John Prendergast, he's a peacemaker, a hero. He used to work in the White House, and he's still trying to end the war. We shot at it a couple of times, I and mean, a particular missile shot at the plane I was in, and uh, I had guns, you know, in the in the forehead. These kind of incidents. He's one of the world's most respected conflict resolution experts. It occurs to me he's also extremely attractive. <laughs> John is going to Uganda. What's he going to do? He's going to bait a trap for Joseph Coney. You, you can't go and meet the, the rebel leader now. No Westerner who's gone to try to meet him has come out alive. Does it not occur to him that he might not come out alive? Doesn't it occur to you that you might not come out alive? <laughs> That's so fucking hot. <laughs> well, I'm going to persuade him, who used to work here, 
for Lev Lee, who still works here. Follow your propaganda. There's an enormous problem. What does he do? Specialises in conflict resolution. What am I? English. Specialising in conflict avoidance. <laughs> Genuine photograph. That's my parents. Uh, they didn't speak to each other between 1979 and 1990. Why? <laughs> trying to avoid a scene. Well, doomed to a John Prendergast. Until the highly prestigious independent newspaper call me. They say, Jane, this is true. Jane, we want you to write a feature for us. Me? Really? Yes. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but we think you would be perfect to do a story about dating out of your league. <laughs> Tell the independent, no, there's a bloke I'd like to interview, he's in Washington. What does he do? He ends war by the things right for the independent. Well, he's perfect for the independent. Imagine if, I don't know, imagine if Bono wasn't a cunt. Right, this man's, <laughs> this man's day job is to put an end to war. Is he at least a celebrity? Oh my God. Yeah, all right then. George Bush was looking for Bono. <laughs> I'm on a plane to Washington. Washington. I'm so into politics now, I bought a trench coat. I meet, I meet John Prendergast. His eyes are red from saving the world. I've got complete pieces. I say, hello, Jane Busman, independent. Can I get one out? He says, what? No. So much preparation. It was a fifteen dollar lip plopping chill. <laughs> Kay's in. It's a phenomenal interview. He talks about war crime, counter terrorism, human rights violations, doesn't mention a wife. <laughs> so, what we have now is a degeneration now into famine like conditions in certain locations now. That you, that your um, motivation to do the whole thing was the Ethiopian famine in the first place, and that's what we're looking at now. Or something. This man is so useful. His next meeting is with Kofi Annan. He let me go in with him to the United States. Idiot! Look, I'm right, I'm right there, I'm right there, like Kofi Annan. Kofi, we all know what you're most famous for. I don't think he feels appreciated for your inner talent. Hmm? <laughs> After the meeting, John is trying to leave. I've got seconds to persuade him to let me go with him to Africa. So I say, John. Because I'm right about what you're doing in Uganda. He says, who for? I say, the newspaper. <laughs> well, the foolish thing. Because John said, yeah. He's leaving Uganda in two weeks. I have a small problem, which is that no newspaper wants this story. I've told him I'm doing it. I'm calling everybody. I even called NPR. <laughs> NPR. <laughs> They cover a fart in a cup. <laughs> July 21st, he's leaving for Uganda. There must be someone I haven't called. Absolutely desperate. <laughs> the mail on Sunday, written as a somewhat politically right of centre family newspaper. Sample headline, blank people. Whose fault are they? <laughs> I've got the travel pages, but I'm also a very serious travel journalist. I say, hey Frank, it's Jane. <laughs> How about I write a travel feature about volunteering? I could be a teacher at a school in Uganda. Frank says, hmm. Good for it, Jane. Altruism is in. Thank fuck for tsunamis. <laughs> Go on the internet. Find a Ugandan school. Hello, can I come be a teacher? Thanks, bye. Okay, first so weekend. I'm now flying, it's a true story. I'm now flying to Uganda to teach with no teaching qualifications. Because what I really want is to write a serious piece about 20 to 64,000 kidnapped black children. And the only way you can achieve this in today's media climate is by sending Mail on Sunday readers on vacation to a war zone <laughs> full of black people. Fuck it. I'm at the airport, they're calling my flight. Thinking, hang on a minute, I can't just fly to a Ugandan war zone, it's insanity. I know. My friend Paul makes documentaries. Paul's been to Uganda. Paul will give me some reassurance. I call him, Paul says, Uganda? No. No, Jane, Uganda, no. You get dragged into the bush. 
The NRA dragged into the bush and macheted. Can't even take a taxi without being mugged. Well, that's it. I sent the mail on Sunday an email. Sorry, Frank, I can't do it. I lied. There's no such place as Uganda. <laughs> I've got one new email, and it's from the Sunday Times of Britain, the greatest newspaper in the world. It's from Sean Dot Ryan, foreign editor. It says, Jane, we really want this story about John Prendergast. I'm a foreign correspondent. Fuck! Well, I didn't waste another second. I ran straight to duty free and I bought sunglasses. Yeah! <laughs> All my way to Africa. Born free, as free as the wind blows, as free. Africa. On the plane. Stop feeling really odd. Drunk, obviously, but also, God, I think, my God, first time in my career, don't feel like an arsehole. I must be with my people. When I look around me at my people, I'm on the plane with 200 missionaries. It's not their fault. I think, right, I better do some research, finally. Uganda is here. And there was more. <laughs> Slang term for a penis is warper. I'm sorry, are you questioning my research? <laughs> Can you read this caption? We land at Entebbe Airport, which is just about here. <sighs> and there's nowhere to get there except taxis. I'm told I'm going to get mugged. The taxi driver is a nice man. He's got a badge with a photo. It's a photo of a cat. <laughs> First thing I see in Africa is this. It's a poster for abstinence. It's got a picture of this woman. Look at her. She's just so happy not to be having sex. It says she's keeping herself for marriage. What about you? I'm trying to give it away, of course, but thanks for reminding me. <laughs> now, taxi driver explained it. This is genius. This is the official government policy for fighting AIDS. All you have to do is stay a virgin until you're married, like this gentleman. <laughs> uh, because his wife, uh, this lady here, should have been a virgin too. And uh, as we know, once they're married, married people will never sleep with anyone else again. Uh, loving gay. Where do you think this wise advice came from? Any ideas? Any ideas? This poster is paid for by the United States government. Don't have sex, African people. Because you know what will happen. <laughs> I, checked, I checked into the youth hostel. I checked into this youth hostel. I was the only white girl in this place who didn't have a bandana around her head. These white people have found the second they arrive in Africa, they start dressing like mammy from gone with the wind. Fucking <laughs> hell. And I'm waiting for John Prendergast. Today's the day this man is going to end the war. I'm uncovering it. Then perhaps cocktails. <laughs> and I have got an email. John Prendergast. And it says, Sorry, Jane, I've gone back to Washington. I spent four grand on airfares and stupidly expensive sunglasses. A stink of missionary farts. It's not me back for a month. So I'll make a phone call. It's that the school. Probably come be a teacher now. Fuck. To get to the school, to a public taxi. As soon as you get on, people come running up to sell you stuff. There's a man standing outside this bus who is selling empty water bottles, refilled with a yellow liquid. <laughs> Is this man selling his own pets? <laughs> it was a business plan that he had for a while. Wake up one morning, how am I going to do with this record-breaking collection of pets? <laughs> this one I'm teaching uh, Ugandan village children. I think, what on 
half of I don't think you gowns in the village children. Brilliant. I'm <laughs> <laughs> going to teach African village children how to tackle the unexpected obstacle at the beginning of Act 2. <laughs> right, watch this. This is my fucking task. Watch this girl. Look at her. Look at her. Look at her. Look at that. She's laughing at me. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> Step tight in front of the class. Stay at me. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> Hands up, who likes Harry Potter? <laughs> they haven't got shoes. Look okay, at my mind goes staring at me. What the fuck is that? I think my mind goes blank. Just tell him a story. Tell him a story. I can't even think of a story. Tell him a story. Any story. Oh, this is a classic Hollywood archetype. I'm brilliant. This is a classic Hollywood archetype. It's a be careful what you wish for story. It's about a policeman. His name is Rick. I'm now drawing stick people on a dive, on a blackboard for like 14 year olds. It's about a policeman, his name is Rick. He has to catch four escaped criminals who've escaped. Then he meets a girl, then he's told he's got a killer, and why am I drawing the plot to Blade Runner? On a blackboard in Uganda! I can't stop. End of Act Two, his partner arrives on a spinner. That's like a hovercraft. And at the end, we learn that her spirit is more important than the fact that she's a replicant. Never mind. John Prendergast calls. Would I mind leaving the children now? <laughs> to meet him in the war zone. So I'm in the bus on the way to the war zone. A man turns to me and says, Are you a journalist? No, a foreign correspondent. He says, Be careful, because people be watching you. The Acholian Gulu. I'm told to wait for my interview here. This is the only safe hotel in northern Uganda. I can't afford to stay in it. We have to work for a charity to afford it. <laughs> Moses is full of Westerners who've come to save the children by drinking loads of wine. I mean, well, I'm living off this. Soon, this will be a hygienic donut. Shortly, shortly after this picture was taken, a live chicken fell in it. I ate it anyway. And I'm waiting for John, and I'm so excited. And my interview finally arrives. Now, the more observant among you may notice this is not John Prendergast. This is Father Carlos, he's a missionary. I said, excuse me, where's John? I said, I don't know. He's probably been held up. By how long? I don't know, a couple of weeks. But it turns out, Father Carl, he's also a peacemaker and he's significantly more important than John Prendergast to the Ugandan peace process. So I decided to interview him to ask him what John's like. <laughs> 20 minutes later, we finally establish he's never even met John Prendergast. Have a listen to kidnap kids, Joseph County, blah, 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 Jesus. Finally. He tells me something, throws my whole story out the window. Father Carlos told me one day, he opened his door, there on the doorstep is a letter. It came from out of the bush and it was delivered by this man. This is one of Joseph Coney's top commanders was. Can you see his t-shirt? Can you see that, yeah? Uh, I can tell you as a travel journalist, this is a very popular t-shirt everywhere except North America. <laughs> letter says, Joseph Coney wants to let some children go free. So Father Carlos went into the bush, he's armed with nothing but a Bible. Joseph Coney's men gave him dozens of kids back, no bullets fired. But when the priest went back to get more children, and how often can you say that in a positive context? <laughs> <laughs> he walked into a trap, set on fire, firebombed, and it wasn't Joseph Coney's men. It was the Ugandan government army. Now, I can tell, this is no 800 words, on Nicole Ritchie and her poor rescue dog. <laughs> oh, I met her, she's lovely, she's quite delightful. But that's not a poor dog, that's a rat that got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have them. You have friends with even these billions in foreign aid. And they can be stopping people, rescuing Joseph Coney, kids from Joseph Coney. This is a massive story. I have to write this story, because if I write this story, 
John Prendergast might fancy me. <laughs> Just then, everybody stops because a pickup truck's pulled up. Out of the pickup truck gets this man. This is the boss of the army, boss of the Uganda government army. He's got this walk, kind of like 10 months, kind of like this. so big it's breaking a stride. <laughs> I know. It's my duty for our correspondent to get an interview with this man. But for some reason, as soon as I stand up, I need to go to the toilet. But I came out of the toilet, it can't be more than an hour later. It's gone. And I Google, it starts getting dark. And thousands of children start appearing. Kids coming from everywhere. Human time. Get talking to this little one, don't know, is that Algernon? So what are you doing? He tells me every night he leaves his mum in the village and he walks miles with the other children to sleep in a concrete shed behind an armed guard so he won't get kidnapped in the night by Joseph Coney. Finally it hits me. I really am. In a war zone. Check into a hotel. It's dark, it's creepy, it's full of soldiers. But I back up my hard drive onto a CD. I label it cold place and no one will want it. <laughs> Next morning, I go straight to the Echolian. I go get into with this colonel, asking, are you sabotaging peace? He won't talk to me, he's talking to charity people, having a huge breakfast. But on the way back, I pass this building. Really cool, 60s modern. Yeah, what's the first thing you think when you see this? Yeah? Buy it, four grand. Ship it to WeHo, sell it to a gay man, make four million. <laughs> as soon as I take this picture, this man, here he is, there he is, there he is, there he is, he comes running out, he goes, you, you're gonna! There he is. What's this building? Well, let's take a look at that sign, there it is. I'm afraid if you can't read that, you've got the beginnings of a serious degenerative eye condition. <laughs> it clearly says, Lint Marketing Board. Who <laughs> does need a publicist, doesn't it? <laughs> But, I get back to the hotel, burning my photos onto a CD. They told me I'd accidentally photographed Colonel Atemis' torture chamber. I threw somebody out the window. Now, I'm from Los Angeles, I knew what to do. I went jogging. When I came back, someone's broken into my hotel room, taken my camera. Changed hotels. Who thought this through? <laughs> Finally relaxed. Do some work on my laptop, type up my father Carlos notes, and I go out to look for a frozen yogurt. A total fucking waste of time. Come back. Someone's broken into my room, this room, this hotel, taken my laptop. I'm under surveillance. Who would want a brand new laptop? But, Gulu Police Station. This is the poster that was on the wall. Just a casual <laughs> moment. <laughs> Policeman comes in. He says, Can I help you? I say, Yes. Someone stole my camera and my computer. Policeman says, Where is he? I'll shoot him in the head. <laughs> I said, Could I just get a police report? <laughs> Policeman says, Have you got one? <laughs> no, I hope you might have. <laughs> Policeman says, Madame, we've only got one police report. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> True. Second policeman comes in, he looks at me, he goes like this, he goes, Have you got children? No. Do you want children? <laughs> this policeman, this Ugandan policeman, gave me his phone number, a bit of paper. I turn the bit of paper over, on the back it says, Does the hymen show signs of tearing? <laughs> I'm uncontrollably horny by the time the boss comes in. CIDs, detective. He looks at me, he goes, Can I help you? I say, yes. I've come all the way from Los Angeles. Someone's stolen my camera and my computer. Detective, isn't he? CID. He analyzes the case. He goes, hmm. He came from Los Angeles. He had a computer. Could you help me find an agent? Because I've written a novel. <laughs> I'm going to read to you now from across my lips. Burgers. I should, I should have 
I should tell you that on the back of the policeman's novel, there's a list of people he gives his grateful thanks to, and two of them have been crossed out. <laughs> Brawny sexual abuser was wearing fur. <laughs> he looks like a mighty chimpanzee with a lean and mean, muscular, stiff genitals. <laughs> well, as I'm leaving Gulu Police Station, I get to, I think it's a sixth sense. It tells me these cops may not find my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning, back to the Achillean. Will the colonel talk to me? No, he won't. Somebody gives me a ticket. Coney's wife, who's got 104 of them, has just escaped. She's being held under government protection just up the road here. Well, I run, run here, blag an interview with her. They let me in. She's a very tall girl. She's called Andrea, but this tall. I say, are you happy to be going home? So I'm a brilliant journalist. <laughs> she says, no, it's Joseph Coney's going to find me. Look at her. She's under government protection. What does this mean? And they bring me this girl called Anna. Now, Anna's a very pretty girl, she's got a huge smile. It's like Jessica Simpson, except not repulsive. <laughs> Chatting away quite amicably. And she suddenly says, I killed a boy called Peter. Well, could I ask you why? She goes, yes, because he was my friend. Because he was my friend. When Joseph Coney caught him escaping, found him, they gave me the machete, told me to cut off the top of his head, back of his head, his leg, and then kill him. Most unfortunate. Well, that night, back at the hotel, can't sleep. I'm thinking, what will happen to this girl, Angela, if Coney's men find her? Colonel's job to protect her. Is he doing it? Can't sleep. <clears throat> Tried reading. <laughs> <coughs> it quailed suddenly when he imagined the glimmering room and its pleasurably feeling relatedness. <laughs> Someone was hitting her cake. <laughs> Didn't help. <laughs> Next day, I decided to go and find Angela. I said, she's gone. You're too late. Where's she gone? Kick them. Kick them. This is where Coney's child soldiers would ambush moving vehicles. A bloke from UNICEF tells me he is not even allowed in Kick them without an escort. By escort, he does not mean Elton John's boyfriend and a can of spunk. No. He <laughs> means this. $40 I've got this. Driver turns to me and says, where are we going? Thinking, Coffee bean on sunset, shoot everybody. <laughs> driver, driver says, have you got a bulletproof vest? No. No. It's Victoria's secret miracle bra. <laughs> we set off and we pass this burned out truck from an ambush. We pass the Blue Moon nightclub. We totally made it. Machine guns, <laughs> machetes, army uniform, flip flops, and Coca Cola. <laughs> Wednesday night is ladies. Why do I bother? Why do I bother? Angela's been sent to a protected village. I have to get this right because it's legally implicating. What is a protected village? It is a specially built village protected by the entire foreign aid industry. It's protected by the Ugandan army, protected by the charities and the United Nations. The refugees get free food, free schools, free healthcare, even solar power clinics, and a savings and loan scheme. Billions of dollars from taxpayer and donations. This is what it really looked like. No soldiers anywhere to be seen, no charities anywhere to be seen, no soldiers over the age of 10 anyway. Just two million hungry people living in a pile of shit, a few minutes down the road from a luxury hotel full of aid workers. Why? I can't find Angela. There took me seven girls her age who just been kidnapped by Coney's men. Why? Why? Well, I found her. She's fine. But I've not seen such a depressing sight as these cams, so I caught my ex-boyfriend crying and masturbating at the same time. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Drive back. Something's not right now, because apart from 
and these cows, I see nothing but fertile farmland. It's like the government has created these artificial pockets of African depressiveness for journalists like me. They tell me, it wasn't just journalists like me, a man from the British government, he came and saw these cows. What did he say? Get the refugees out of the camps, catch Coney. No. He said, I'm going to give 700 million pounds in aid. Who to? Fat chunk to the people that drove them into the camps. I'm starting to think this war's a con. I'm thinking they don't want to catch Joseph Coney. You no, know, Jane, that's a very irresponsible thing to say. Hmm? They're right there now and they're looking for Coney very, very hard. Hmm? All right, let's take one school kidnapping. It's a one school I visited, St Mary's School. Of 139 pupils kidnapped in one night, a number of girls rescued by deputy headmistress, she's a tiny little Italian nun about yay high, 109. A number of girls rescued by Ugandan army, 40,000 of them, one. None, 109. Army, one. There were no easy answers, said Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> well, fuck me, I would not sit next to Hillary Clinton in maths. <laughs> and I get a mystery phone call. He says, Jane, do you remember me? I was behind you on the bus. You work very hard for a journalist. I'm being threatened and patronised simultaneously. <laughs> what are they trying to stop me writing? Now, in Hollywood, it's very simple. You don't ask Kevin Spacey how he came to injure his head, tripping over a dog, four in the morning in a central London park. <laughs> I'm a little bit out of my depth. I get back to the hotel and I think, oh, yes, did you see that man watching you at breakfast? No. No, my notebook goes missing. My notebook, the whole thing's full of diagrams of war crimes with arrows pointing straight to the doodle of Colonel Otema. Dead. Until John Prendergast comes back to Uganda. He says, would I mind meeting him in a nice hotel? Where am I going to find? A lip plumping gel. <laughs> God, I spent the day going around African drugstores saying, Do you sell lip plumping gel? <laughs> I was punished by God. That night I'm getting ready for my big day's interview. <laughs> Find a tiny canker sore. I just had to clean out this canker sore with an African safety pin. <laughs> John says, meet me at the Sheraton. In the theme pub. <laughs> he arrives. He's got his big meeting with President Museveni. He's going to talk about peace or something. I've got one hour before his meeting to make this work, and I'm ready. Stilettos, cocktail dress, the lawn. What the fuck? I've walked the fourth of African safety pin. He says, well, yeah. President Museveni would make peace with Joseph Coney if it made him look good to the rest of the world. Eh, eh. The rest of the world doesn't give a damn. Eh, eh, eh. Right on cue, John got a phone call. Now, who do you think this phone call was? President Museveni, now too busy to talk peace. John, who might, I don't know, he might just possibly have had the end of the war in his briefcase. He goes, batshit. He goes, they can finish this fucking war in 30 minutes. Go to Museveni's office with the World Bank. You say the money's over? Over this war would be 30 minutes flat. I'm thinking, this is the sexiest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Stop it, Jane. This man was going to end the war tonight, and now he can't. Well, then he's free later. Stop it. <laughs> John said he's got to go find someone who can protect some refugees. I let him go. <laughs> $108, a fat lip, one contact lens. I look like Marty Feldman. <laughs> <laughs> this is my last chance to be a useful person. I call the Sunday Times. I say, listen, this story's bigger than John Prendergast. This is kids getting bombed. It's a big government. We're paying for it. Sean Lyon, foreign editor, he says, that sounds interesting. Could you get me your bullet points tonight? Because if you can get me um, 2,000 words by next Thursday, I'll run it at the weekend. 2,000 words in the Times, that's like a full page. Shit, bullet points. I ran to the internet cafe. Oh no, my dad, we're tired, we're closing, we're closing. No, 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 no. Bullet points, bullet points, very important. Bullet points. Not bullets, bullet points.
points <laughs> sent. Now, I'm not going to write an enormous story. I've got no computer. Local radio station. Lovely. They say, you can use ours. I'm writing all night long. Like Watchman. He catches me. He goes, who are you? I'm white. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 words. Will I have enough? I'm writing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Will I have enough? 40,000 soldiers. Couldn't catch Coney. Why not? The 40,000 soldiers weren't even looking for Coney. They were in the Congo, illegally mining, duty free shopping. 2,000 words. Will I have enough? Finally, 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 Wednesday morning I do a word count. 100,000 words. I accidentally written a novel in four days. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> now you tell me which AIDS ravaged, kidnapped child soldier, fucking prostitute toddler I cut out now. <coughs> Nobody's <it's> choice. <laughs> fucking piece of piss, there was two of them. Finally, Thursday afternoon, 6 o'clock London time, I've got it down to 7,000 words, nearly 2,000. <laughs> Called the Sunday Times. I said, I wondered if you had a chance to look at my bullet points, because I am nearly done. <coughs> Sean Ryan, foreign editor, says, Jane, I never got these bullet points. Because that night in the internet cafe, emailing my bullet points to Sean Don Ryan, foreign editor of the Sunday Times of Britain, I emailed those bullet points to Sean Hayes, flamboyant supporting star of TV. <laughs> Justifiably killed. I'm not going to get paid a penny. <coughs> I have to go on an eight hour bus journey to take money out of the only bank that will give me any money. My credit card's been stopped. 24 people on this minibus, 14 seats. I am between the only two fat people in Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a thong. <laughs> so what you? Have you been saved? Born again Christian. <coughs> no, I've not been saved. Fucking in the child's been taken into protective custody. Jesus. What about Anna? What about Anna? What about all those girls in that camp? I had a once in a lifetime real chance to do something useful and I failed. Now the bus breaks down. We all get out and push. Pushing it. I call my sister. I say, Kate, okay, all the British airways, I'm giving up, I'm going to come home. Kate says, hang on. Then I notice the bus has started to roll away. These born again Christians have jumped on it. They've left me at the side of the road. I'm completely alone in the middle of Africa. Yet still, talking on a blackberry like a wanker. <laughs> it comes back on. British Airways have got one seat left tomorrow morning. Now do you want it? Come on. We're at the Jimmy Choo sale. It's a war zone. <laughs> well, if I go back to Los Angeles, it's a clear cut choice, isn't it? Do I stay here, like that kids getting bombed on that shilling? Or do I go back to Los Angeles, where it is safe? I've got some really great things. <laughs> I tell myself I'm staying in Uganda, and I make one last phone call by a miracle Colonel Atema asked me. He said, You want to interview me? You meet me tomorrow morning. The Atrillian. We got a paddle. Paddle? Not because the paddle. You get a paddle, you get shot. It's a scoop. Brilliant. So next morning, I'm waiting the Atrillian for the Colonel. But people start coming up to me. They're saying, You know the Colonel's a very dangerous man. Yes. Lawyer, he tells me he's investigating the colonel's army. So, oh God, what have you got? Let me see now, I've got 26 cases of rape, I've got 24 cases of murder, I've got about six cases of torture in six weeks. Oh yeah, peak season. <laughs> <laughs> so why did I do this? I should not have had that goat. I'd be at NTB Airport having a nice martini on the toilet. <laughs> colonel comes in, get in his truck, we set off. Oh my God, he won't talk to me. I've got no idea what he's talking, he's talking Uganda. I'm in the back of the truck with a murderer. I bet he's got my camera, he's got my computer, he's got my notebook. He's driving me into the middle of nowhere to shoot me in the head. Ashton Kutcher's lawyer. This has got Marty Singer's stamp all over it. <laughs> I said, my sister, the following text message, hi Kate, it's me, everything's fine, but if I'm found dead, um, it was not Joseph Coney, it was Colonel Charles the Tenor. P.S. Don't tell Mum. <laughs> deleted it. The grass got longer till the truck is swallowed. If I was not so close to shitting myself, I would be shitting myself. <laughs> Pull over, get out. Colonel's there, furious, looking at me. 
on one side is him, 30 years experience in the African army, six foot tall, 250 pounds. On the other, it's me, 15 years experience in celebrity journalism, five foot five and a half, weight varies. <laughs> I can only really tell you one thing about this moment when you think you're gonna die, and that's your mind, which becomes an empty shell. All intelligent thought, gone. So naturally I said, you're an amazing shape, Carl. What's your secret? <laughs> I swear, his whole face changes, and he goes, exercise. Every day I've gone for an hour. You know, it's the only way to keep fit. Which means, not only does this magic celebrity question work anywhere, <laughs> but a Ugandan war criminal is the only person that ever gave me an honest answer. <laughs> Go back to the Charlie Inn. I ask him the real question. Colonel, are you winning this war? He says, of course, Joseph Kony can't kidnap anymore. I thought, this doesn't make sense. He must know Joseph Kony's still kidnapping. Why? Doesn't make sense. Sitting at the bar, hitting on the barman. Limited success. It's a terrific beer. So we're going to tell boss how terrific you are. And the barman didn't like that idea, not just because he's got self-respect, but because his boss, the owner of the whole Acholi Inn, he tells me, is Colonel Charles of Tamar. When I looked around me, all the Westerners come to save the children, all of them on expense accounts, donations and taxes, all paying straight to the Colonel. And I wondered why he hadn't caught coming yet. So this day, well, I'm going to get this story out. I came back to Hollywood and I pitched this story, I really did, as a movie. And this is what the Hollywood movie guy said to me. He said, Jane, this is an incredible story. Does it have to be in Africa? <laughs> legal reasons, does it have to be in Africa? Africa's so depressing, it's been written out of its own movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, I will write it. Kenya, I mean, it's a nice young man, works for a charity, he's trying to save an endangered antelope. Why is it endangered? It's dying out, it's tragic. Why is it dying out? It's really bad at mating. It can't raise its young. And it runs into trees and kills itself. <laughs> it can't even mate. Do you think this chanting worker's job involves finding the world's stupidest antelope and wanking it off? <laughs> Send him money. North Africa. I mean, a charity teaching drama to failed suicide bombers. Because they've got no sense of drama. <laughs> Congo. I mean, a Belgian charity that have flown to the Congo to do dance therapy. Belgians teaching Africans to dance. <laughs> so far, I'm not depressed. Oh, but Jane, you must be depressed. I mean, what about the slums? I mean, what about the slums? Very depressing. What about Kibera? It's been in The Guardian and everything. Kibera. They bloody love Kibera. Every comic week, every idol gives back. It is full of celebrities crawling over each other to live in their own poo. Where do Africans live in Kibera? To help Vivian Westwood? <laughs> to have a fat man steal your lunch. <laughs> to pray that Billy Connolly is wearing pants under those white trousers. <laughs> no. Come to look for jobs. That's what one of girl's poverty, Bono's poverty industry don't want to tell you. It's just up the road from the slum is this. Africa has been booming for years. Booming. All that time, I can't get the truth out about Joseph Kony because Africa's so depressing. He was booming. Where are the bank bailouts? Where are the bank for countries? Where? Here are some words. Disease, poverty, economy, national, dictators, corruption, racial tension, primitive, hot, enormous, unstable, Nelson Mandela. Now, these are not the lyrics of U2's new Christmas single. <laughs> As you probably guess, that's what some people said when they were asked the first words that came into their head when they thought of Africa. For who were these people? Some of the world's most important money managers. These are the people that could create jobs for the people trying to escape from Billy Connolly's pants. <laughs> Where do they get this utterly fake idea of Africa? It's a We can't, excuse my Irish accent. 
We can't fix every problem. Corruption, natural calamities are part of the picture here. Are they? Africa's naturally dishonest. <laughs> now Madonna adopted that little African kid. Did you call her up? He might, Robert Barnum, he has. Mm -hmm. I heard about the little African fellow. You might want to lock up your valuables. <laughs> no! <laughs> That's right, children. Escort that man out of your school. <laughs> with the poverty industry lie. Let me tell you something about Oxfam. Oxfam got busted when someone spotted their blog looking for a new swimming pool cleanup. Well, I heard on, on the ground in Africa that since this scandal, there have been big shake-ups in the poverty industry. I heard this from a water engineer. There will be no more money for swimming pools. From now on, you fill in the expenses claim about water tanks. It's true. Here I am by my favourite water tank. This is, this is the dirty little secret of the poverty industry. Luxury. Luxury. He worked for the United Nations, that's said, UNICEF, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, all that mob. You could get a hardship allowance of thousands on top of your salary, tax-free salary, to compensate you for difficult living conditions at places like Nairobi. This is Nairobi. Not for profit, eh? Not for profit. UNICEF. Let me tell you about UNICEF. Next time you're on a long haul flight and you're trying to get a bit of sleep between a screaming child and a halitosis king, and you're woken up, it's a fact, it's an upsetting film, asking you to put money in the change of the good envelope. Consider this UNICEF, for decades, nowhere near you on the plane. You might fly long haul in Carney. UNICEF, choose the free champagne, business class. For just a dollar, you can help a child. You buy a stamp and send a resume to the United Nations. <laughs> it's like a sort of humanitarian Dita Von Teese. She's looking at me. That is unacceptable. Really? What about that? It's a penis. <laughs> this African how to behave. You may know her, this is Dambisa Moya, she's an African economist, and she wrote a book called Dead Aid that said maybe aid to Africa was not working. Well, Bono's people shat themselves. They start sending out emails. This is that from Tyler.Denton at one, that's Bono's people, dot org, two, Iris Mwanza, subject, urgent help. Dr. Mwanza, I hope this email finds you well. Such a pleasure meeting you last year during one's trip to Cousin Paste, Zambia. Thank you again for your time. Yeah, you want me. What do you want? Writing classical assistance. Bare serious issue. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a new book out called Dead Aid. It's getting a lot of traction in US media at the moment. It's by a Zambian economist named Ambisa Moya. She's calling for all aid to Africa to be cut off in five years. No, she's not, but never mind. <laughs> Even who are fighting AIDS, malaria, and other deadly diseases. Well, she said nothing of the sort, because I don't know who does Bono's research for edge. <laughs> he finally gets to the point. We are collecting quotes from Africans who might disagree with her. Well, he gets this response from Iris Mines number two at Tyler Denton. Dear Tyler, I have read Dead Aid. We have books in Africa. <laughs> I've seen most of Dambisa Moyo's interviews in the press. I've got the internet too. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> I find it ironic your organisation feels the need to mobilise Africans to speak out against her. If Africans feel strongly against her ideas, they shouldn't need to be mobilised by your organisation. More effective would be to open fora for debate. Fora? It's the plural of fora. <laughs> this African speaks Latin. Fuck! <laughs> Please feel free to use this as one of your quotations. Being unfair. Am I being unfair to Bono? I probably am. <laughs> no, I'm being unfair. Let's take a look at all the African advisors that Bono has. Here is African advisors. There they are. Look, African advisors, African advisors. Now let's take a look at the people in charge. 
Next one's black. Next one's black. <laughs> he, he met a black bloke at valet parking. <laughs> said it was really nice. Jesus. Jesus. Now, oh, Jane, you're being disrespectful. African businesses have terrible problems. It's very hard out there. I've met an African businessman. I know it's very hard. He sent me this email. Terrible problem. Subject misconduct. Dear sir, the security have caught Mr. Wallace in the kitchen that he has been engaged in. What? Man on man guy sex with the night cleaner. <laughs> security have been offered to keep quieter. A mobile phone. This $12. <sighs> and a frozen chicken. <laughs> but despite the frozen chicken, Africa's booming. It is booming. It's not depressing. I'm starting a charity. <laughs> This is the former governor of California. <laughs> Just five dollars will buy this man a thong. <laughs> Tell him he didn't get a thong. The Rwandans. That's a segue. <laughs> no one would help the Rwandans being killed by the Hutu Genesee Dare, apart from the French, who helped with the killing. Why? Well, the French. <laughs> <laughs> then something happened. Two million refugees come over the border into the Congo. Refugees, cash cow, charities descent. They gave the refugees everything. But who were the refugees? They were the Hutu Genesee Dare. They were the axe murders that just killed a million, million people. The charities gave these people, they gave them food, medical <coughs> care, they let them re -arm. they paid them in cash, they let them run the camps themselves for two years. Off they went, to start another genocide. Come on, it's Rwanda, it's old news. Rape in the Congo. That's what we're talking about now. Ask Ben Affleck. Hmm? I went to the Congo, I really did. I went to Heal Africa. This is a rape mothership. This is where Hillary Clinton goes to see the rape. <coughs> Priest. He took us to the gift shop. Sorry, workshop. Workshop. <laughs> we're solving the problem of the rape in the Congo by having the rape victims make aprons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see, I bought a rape and here it is. I don't know if you can see this, but the, the fabric they gave the <coughs> rape victims of the Congo. It's covered in pictures of semi-naked women serving beer. I cannot make this up. The priest says to me, oh, that's awful, Jane, for 17,000 people. All right, I'll write about it, get people to send you money. But tell me something, 17,000 rape victims. Is there any rapists in this? Who are these rapists running around anyway? Hutu Genesee Dare. And all the other militia now piling in for a huge war, reanimated, armed, fed by the charities. All the rape victims can do is vote for a better government. What do we do? We pump 31 million into a bent election to keep those women's bent government in power. That is foreign aid. Madonna. She's Italian. I think she looks like fun, don't you? Great. Then she went English, adopted this village idiot. <laughs> then she went African. And even though they're smiling, you know it's going to be depressing, don't you? But she genuinely wants to help Africa. So what does she do? She builds Kabbalah schools. Kabbalah <laughs> 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 schools. <laughs> Child is saying, um, if you don't respect yourself, people won't want to help you because they'll think you're a failure. I wish she didn't think there was anyone there. What did Bono do to Madonna? She used to be great. She used to preach. Papa, don't preach. I'm keeping my baby. Even though he's got a dad in Malawi. <laughs> All those days are numbered because what has Africa got that we have not got? A financial future. <laughs> Booming middle class. What do middle class people do? What do they do? Middle class, what do they do? That's right. They buy overpriced crap. <laughs> crap creates demand. Demand creates jobs. Now they can pay their striking teachers. But not her, she can't spell. <laughs> Joseph Cohen, child kidnapper, I have a solution. 
<laughs> I'm starting a charity. I really am. This is my tender to fight the child soldiers of Joseph Koenig. Operation Restore Hope again. <laughs> Africa. Identify problem. A1. Large number of kidnapped child soldiers in African Central Forest region. Identify problem. B1 bracket. Lack of will to find these children. Identify problem. C3 bracket. Large numbers of European paedophiles and sex tourists <laughs> up and down African east and west coasts. Identify problem. Solution. African paedophiles join hands in a human chain. <laughs> human chain moves slowly north. <laughs> Costs zero dollars. Budget two million. On the ground expenses of Jane Busman Incorporated and non profit. <laughs> now, I really did ask one of our Africa's top mercenaries how much it would cost me to go and get Joseph Coney. And this is what he said, bring him to trial. He said, 900,000 US Jane, and I'll do that Cam Bono for free. <laughs> there you have it. Five million dollars to stop Joseph Coney. It's a charity. I'm going to pocket 4.1 million. But where will I find such wealth? Bono. Bono. Tony Blair, the entire poverty industry. This is the people who've made Africa look like shit for so many years. But however, now think about this. Bono's a tax efficiency expert. He's going to want value for money. So here is my offer to you. For one million dollars each, I promise to stop calling you cunts. <laughs> Feel free to join in, ladies and gentlemen. I will stop reminding listeners that Bono is a cunt who lectures on generosity with a tax dodge in Holland. What is he? A cunt! <laughs> the kind of cunt who says that he's going to go to Africa and do Louis Vuitton ads in Africa. What is he? A cunt! <laughs> the kind of cunt who gives a concert in Berlin to celebrate the Berlin Wall coming down and then builds a wall around it to stop people getting in without tickets. <laughs> what is he? A cunt! <laughs> George Bush, who says, I'll give you money to fight AIDS, but not if you spend it on condoms. What is he? A cunt! <laughs> Tony Blair, Christ, what a cunt! <laughs> Tony Blair, who sets up a charity called the Tony Blair Africa Governance Initiative. A war criminal telling Africans how to behave. Cunt! <laughs> I'm not even going to get into your cunt friends' things, cunt fests. And how to rethink how change happens in our society, in this Italian mansion. Or was it French? Chateau cunt sur le <laughs> Don't even care anymore. Christ, what a bunch of cunts. Bono didn't do a concert for Africans for years. And then when some Africans were having a concert, he barges on stage and does this. <laughs> it is not fair for me to keep playing a YouTube clip and calling him a cunt. We must let the public speak. <laughs> George Bush and Sting stop Joseph Coney. Everybody wins. And if any of these cunts want to sue me, I'll conduct my own defence. I've already written it. Your Honour, what kind of cunt would take me to court over this? I rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.